Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome back to Revival Live. Today in the studio, we have with us a very special guest, Dr. Jelani. Dr. Jelani is the author of the book, Fall of Capitalism and Rise of Islam. He's carried the dawah for the establishment of the Khilafah at a global level and wrote many articles and published numerous publications. Dr. Muhammad Jelani received his PhD degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, USA, in computer engineering. He's currently the uh, an adjunct professor at Capital Technology University, Maryland, USA. Say, and was a faculty member at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He has a wide industrial experience where he was a senior member of the technical staff at Sun Microsystems and senior software engineer at Motorola uh, and chief architect at uh, Cambium Networks. He is the founder of Counterfeit Combat Technologies, CCT Incorporated, and uh, Intellisys, a startup concerned with enabling security systems using the detection of human emotions uh, using s physiological factors. Dr. Jelani has published numerous papers in international journals, conferences, and in various areas of computer engineering and science. Dr. Jelani has published several patents in the information and telecom technology sector. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to the show. It's such an honor you, you, to have you, you here. You, you spoke too much about my profile, but anyway. I, I just read what was on the uh, card. <laughs> yeah. okay, All so, right. So I guess, uh, yeah, t joining us today is uh, Hatib Umar and Haris Umar. Assalamu alaikum, guys. Assalamu alaikum, guys. All right. So uh, we have a wonderful <laughs> show lined up today. We're going to get into the story of... Uh, Dr. Jelani's path. Uh, we're going to go back as far as he wants, and uh, I'm going to let Harris kind of dictate uh, the, the the journey here. So, inshallah, yep. Harris, why don't you open it up? And, yes, and yes, yes. So, uh, Bismillah. So, uh, inshallah, we have a uh, like uh, Brother Irfan mentioned, we have a very exciting uh, story lined up for you guys. There's generally four parts that we want to get through in this discussion, time permitting, and uh, we might have to come back for a part two, which is. Uh, uh, the more the better. So uh, we just want to start off uh, uh, with that introduction. Uh, I just want to get into a little bit of uh, how we met uh, Abu Talha. Uh, this is actually, story actually goes back 10 years ago now. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, I was a senior in uh, high school at that time, 18 years old. And uh, uh, and uh, Hatib will help me recall some of the details on how, how we got into that. So uh, Hatib, uh, take it away. That's the story I didn't know about. The story yeah, you didn't yeah. know about. This is the first time we're, so I think we're telling yeah, you. Let's hear the story. Yeah, subhanAllah, <laughs> man. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Dr. Jelani, you uh, definitely played a hand in, in many ways. And, and, you know, Allah uses us all for certain reasons and some, you know, far far above others. So the the way, so we, we had never even met at all. I think we were on different planets, different <laughs> wavelengths, <laughs> different, different countries completely, right? And um, so after after graduating high school, we were learning about the world, uh, why things are the way they are, why the Muslims are the way they are, the nations are in such a way, what happened to us, all these things, learning about, um, you know, what, you know, how the world is working, essentially. One of the books that I happened to find uh, on this journey was was your book, actually. It was ah, the, uh, the Fall the, of Capitalism yeah, and Rise of Islam. Exactly, the Fall of Man. Capitalism and the Rise of Islam. I thought no, nobody ever read my book. <laughs> you, know, so, <laughs> you never know. You never know. You, you have to take the shot. You have, yeah, you have no good, idea where it's, where, where it's going to hit. It's good news. And uh, so I, the, I approached the book like, oh, there's a Muslim brother writing about this. Maybe he's just making stuff up because I think in that same time I was uh, – Looking to books by you know a, a certain Muslim uh, person that was just making stuff up from science and stuff uh, you know similarly but you know Subhanallah when I read it it was accurate it was um, profound it was it was talking about Islam in a way that it wasn't really done before and, and it needed to be there right and so I would I, I would give you know essentially dawah to this book I, 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 I was starting to you know, I was starting university at that point I was like brother you should reach you know, this book and this book and this book, and one of them was The Fall of Capitalism and the Rise of Islam. And I would talk to Brother A, Brother B, Brother C in college as I'm trying to, you know, learn about Islam, go on this personal journey myself, to figure out how the world is working. And the response was usually, uh, yeah, okay, a book, I'll think about it. Or, yeah, you know, may maybe some other time. And one brother was like, you know, actually, oh, I know him. Hmm. I'm like, oh, you read the book. We will have a good, we'll have a good discussion. He's like, no, I didn't read the book, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, I I know the brother, and you know what? He actually gives a really good uh, tafsir session at this particular masjid, and it it ended up being our local masjid. Mm -hmm. You know, so, <laughs> that, so at that time we didn't attend too frequently. To be yeah, honest with yeah. you, yeah, yeah. So 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 it was like you know we read a, a random book 
from some person that came on the other side of the world. And it just so well, happened that... You found the book on, on uh, Barnes Noble Nook. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's a funny story. Right, so you it. found it online. Yeah, we found it online. Uh, right so, and you had no idea the guy's right next to you. <laughs> and, 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 and not only did you know send the book, but he sent the man right next to us. Too. <laughs> so, on, on. Yeah, so... So uh, that was a very interesting time today. I think you, you had it had it this year for a long time. The um, the year of the Quran in order of revelation, yes. right? Mm. And uh, you know, we, you know, we we sat there, we learned, and I mean, the rest in a way is history. But yeah, it was it, it's just an example of like you do an effort and you have no idea where when work. it will ever produce its uh, its product. It's or true, flourish. Yeah. yes, so, true. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah, so open it up. Uh, you know, yeah. you're Jordanian. You grew up in Jordan. You grew up in well, the second part is true. Grow up in Jordan. Okay. Usually, I don't like to uh, title myself or identify myself as a Jordanian or Arab or someone. These are notions that I am from a place called Jordan. But Jordanian, that's identity. Mm -hmm. And I like to keep my identity as uh, a Muslim. And uh, that identity, Jordanian, was given by the British. The British, when they controlled the area, during the imperialism, they called this place Jordan and everyone who lived there Jordanian. Before that, we were used to be called Syrians or from Sham. Mm, and Shami. before that, from the Ottoman state. And before that, only Muslims. Mm. So now all of this transferred to the point that I'm Jordanian, you are Pakistani, he's Indian, this is Syrian, this is Palestinian. This is absolutely an Islamic identity. So, so I am from Jordan as a place where the river Jordan flows. Yeah. Uh, but my identity is a Muslim and only Muslim. Now, uh, this is funny because this is something I had uh, come across. Uh, these, all these, uh, is these labels, they're called demonyms, okay? And so whether you're Albanian or Nigerian yeah. or, or, or Saudi or whatever it is, they're, all, they're called demonyms, or the identifiers of yeah. uh, your nation state. And uh, what I tell, you know, whenever people do say that, that, oh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm Lebanese or this and that, I say, you know, the British, they weaponized demonyms and they broke our unity by weaponizing yeah. demonyms. So, no, I'm glad you uh, put me back in yeah. check. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I, I always uh, catch it because when somebody mentions that, I tell them, look, you are a Muslim, first and last. Now, I know you belong to this uh, uh, family, this uh, uh, tribe could be tribe, or you belong to this uh, location. That's fine. Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran says that we have made you nations and tribes. In ya uh, yuhannas uh, unna khalaqnakum min dhakr wa unta wa jalnakum shuba wa qabaila. We made out of you nations and tribes so that you may recognize one another. So I know that where are you from, but once. As an identity, Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, "Huwa al-ladhi sammakum al-Muslimin." He named you Muslims, and I love this name given to me by Allah Azza wa Jal. Yeah, and uh, Hatib brought up an interesting point one time. We were discussing, and he was saying that Islam w uh, was against tribalism; uh, that my people are better than your people. However, the there's still a concept of tribe that you're from a particular family. So uh, can you go a little bit into that about your particular tribe? What was that like? Uh, what was your upbringing like? Your childhood. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Well, I was brought up in uh, uh, a, little, a little village in the farthest north of the place called Jordan now. It's on the border of the Yarmouk River. That's where the Battle of Yarmouk took place wow. uh, between the... Uh, Muslims and the Romans. That was uh, the decisive battle led by Khalid bin Walid. That's where I uh, grew up. And it's on the border of uh, Palestinian uh, territory. Uh, from my home, we oversee all those occupied lands from Palestine and the occupied lands from Syria. That's where I grew up originally. And this uh, small village called Malka, that's why sometimes people call me Malkawi. Uh, on the originally we uh, migrated uh, during the I think the late Abbasi era from uh, area between what's called today Iraq and Iran that's where the uh, Abdul Qadir Jilani was born mm -hmm. uh, so that's where I got my name Jilani as part of that uh, let's say group of people some a person 
I think he's the grandson of Abdul Qadir Jalani. Uh, came to my village, he traveled, and he lived there for a while. He made families, he married, he got descendants. So I come from that uh, uh, that type of descendants. This from the yes, lineage yes. of Muhammad So, so yes. everybody who loves Abdul Qadir Jalani, now yeah. you got to listen to Dr. Jalani. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> uh, yes, of course, he's from the uh, branch of Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, the son of Ali, the son of Fatima, uh, the grandson of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's the uh, the descendants type of line. Now the village was very uh, small village farming uh, in general. Uh, people uh, either worked in the farm mm-hmm. or they uh, worked in the army as soldiers. Uh, very few people have uh, uh, education, and as a result of that, with the lack of education, our parents, my parents' generations were very obsessed with knowledge. So most of my peers, uh, they got their education. Like my father insisted. Mm. My father had uh, uh, nine, uh, had eight boys and three girls uh, (laughs) with very little uh, income. He insisted that each and every one gets his full education. Uh, And many of us are either engineers uh, or uh, teachers or uh, science majors or linguists each and every one got education the same my rivals also so that was uh, something that really had a big impact on me and on my peers at the time so we did have some education very little very little education on Islam mm. Islam was uh, almost on the on the shelf people are Muslims they believe in Islam there are prayers there are there was one masjid in our village mm-hmm. a masjid which was built in 1885 uh, it's, uh, it's an old masjid uh, very uh, historic from the Ottoman time uh, but still uh, Islam was there but it's not with the, it's not deeply rooted from education and knowledge base. It's not the focus. It was a, it was a focus, very yeah. secular education. Uh, in, the, in the school, yes, very secular. Mm-hmm. Now, I would say myself and my brothers were a, a bit different because my grandfather happened to be a mufti mm-hmm. uh, during the, since the time of the Ottomans. Really? He was a mufti of the whole region mm-hmm. uh, at the time, and he left many books i have them now already all are in my own uh, library at home uh, books goes back to 16th 17th century from his father also and the grandfather because all goes to the uh, imam or sultan abdul qadir al-jilani so i that was a privilege where i had some access to some uh, to some uh, books other people uh, mostly no uh, so that's where my initial bringing up uh, so that did have an impact uh, my father uh, himself uh, when he grew up maybe he was 17 years old he went to the army to serve in the army there is no other job to do farming was no, no longer uh, fruitful or beneficial to the people it's not it's, uh, it's not really uh, rewarding mm-hmm. So uh, not only that, but the British who were in charge of the army at the time, they were keen about recruiting young people so they will not work on farms. So to deplete farms from the people who really work and to make the country dependent only on people who serve and they need to get salary and no production. Mm -hmm. So they will always be dependent dependent on the British. So my father was one of them who was recruited when he was uh, very young. Now, while he, when he was recruited, he got in touch with uh, uh, some people who were part of a group uh, called Hizb Tahrir. So he managed to get in that group at early stage. And he was very well uh, thoughtful. His thinking capabilities were way above and beyond his peers. And that also had an impact. Uh, now, he did not finish he finished only i think 12 years and he the uh, intelligence in jordanian uh, 
system, they came aware of his uh, position. Activities. Uh, his activities. Of his activities yeah. and his uh, convictions and loyalties. So they kicked him out of the army at a very early stage. So just uh, dismissed him. Uh, and that also had an impact. Now we see that uh, my father was impacted by an idea because of an idea he carries, because of a thought he has, not because of anything he does harmful. Uh, and that uh, made that in my brain something that I, I will look for whenever I grow up or I, uh, uh, I become a bit more uh, mature in my, in my life. And that's what happened. Right, subhanAllah. The other day at the uh, masjid, you were telling us about how uh, at the age of 15, right, is when you uh, visited America. Could you could you kind of uh, fill in the gaps between the time you're talking about in your childhood and up to yeah. the age of 15? How, how did that happen? How does a, okay. how does a young... And how much did your dad culture you? Yeah. And I have another question, if yeah. I can just throw it in there too, is uh, so you mentioned that your dad got kicked out of the army. So did he go back to farming? Like if you want to put that in the story oh, as well. no. No, my father did not go back to farming. Now, my father utilized his uh, knowledge and thought process that he gained from Hizb al-Tahrir. And he, although he was not educated, he uh, initiated a, a small magazine okay. journal in, uh, in the city. Now, he, he did not go back to the village to live. To live. He lived in, in a big city close to Amman, close to the uh, capital. And he was engaged in the development and publications and distribution of a magazine called Al Sharia. Hmm. Now, Al Sharia was owned before my father joined by someone, a good Muslim, but he does not have uh, objectives. So, uh, my father got involved in that uh, magazine. Very soon, he was injecting those ideas of da'wah and khilafah and the Islamic system and the political system, economy. So the distribution of the magazine uh, multiplied by tens. I think my recollection from him that when he joined, it was maybe a couple of hundred uh, copies were distributed uh, every month. It was a monthly magazine. He took it to become a weekly, and per week they were distributing now more than 2,000 uh, copies. Uh, so at that time too. Yeah, at that yeah. time, and it's all mostly uh, hand Print made media. Uh, uh, efforts. Yep. We don't have the publication capabilities, no internet, no phones, nothing. Mm. We just take it, move to the people, talk to them. This is the magazine. Read it. You don't like it? Give it back to me. Don't pay me until you find if it's useful. Then the subscriptions uh, grow up. So and this is very interesting. The 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 real owner, the first owner of the magazine, he comes to my father and says, look, uh, my father's name is Isam, look Isam, uh, you have made this magazine, it grew up so much, and when you joined here, you did not accept salary, you said, okay, I will work for you just for commission. Commission of whatever I sell, you give me commission. So why don't I make you a good salary? So now the, the owner, he knows that the salary will be definitely much less than the, the, the commission. <laughs> so now, now he says, okay, I will give you, let's, at that time, let's say 200 Jordan dinars. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, it was equivalent to $600 of that time. By today's standard, it's no more than 6000 mm -hmm. Very good salary. So my father told him, look, you have a change of uh, heart now. Since you are seeing that the magazine is growing, is flourishing, uh, now you want to cut my commission and pay me salary. Maybe you pay me salary more than I do by commissions. Maybe the commission will not last for long, but that's a change of heart. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. You should stick to your word. If you don't stick to your word, I am out of here. Mm. So the guy said, okay, let's negotiate. He said, okay, we'll negotiate on the day of judgment. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> so he left there. <laughs> <at death. laughs> wow. And he told them, may Allah... Uh, give you all the risk and you enjoy your magazine but i am out of here mm -hmm. so that type of thing to stick to your word stick to whatever the agreements you did yeah i like that i yep. like this type of motion now he moved and he started doing schools so he built a, a school in the city as zarqa grade school then he built a high school in another city so he was, uh, and all of these 
taught me in real life be aggressive be motivated uh, don't look back uh, don't fear the impact of the society or the government or the intelligence on your life the rizq is from Allah Azza wa Jal and this is a power that I learned it first from my father and later on I learned it when I started reading the Quran and getting more uh, acquainted so that's the very thing that I learned and I knew that my father has courage and adventure that I didn't see it in other people at that time and that's where come when uh, at age of below 15 I was still 14 and 8 months uh, uh, a contest came to our schools saying the uh, there is a program called AFS American Field Service and this American Field Service requires some kids from the uh, high school to uh, go to the United States live with a host family for a year and see how uh, it looks there like an exchange program it's an exchange program but no it's it's one way exchange no, by okay. the way <laughs> the two way exchange nobody wanted to go the other way <laughs> no two way exchange was where american kids would come to europe right or to japan yeah uh, but not to uh, jordan or other uh, small countries oh, no. uh, this was a one way so i participated in the contest i won the contest it was uh, some exams questionnaires etc and uh, uh, i did good uh, I was accepted. My father did not, uh, I mean, object to this. And here is an issue I want to mention. The other day I was uh, talking to this uh, to my sons, how uh, uh, did this happen? There was an interview at the embassy mm. by the U.S. ambassador at the time and an attaché from Jordan uh, to the embassy. So the interview was made by the ambassador and uh, his wife she was in the in the meeting so they want to meet these kids he was asking me oh you you applied for this uh, program this scholarship uh, i said yes and he said oh you, you did good you did good in the uh, exams in the test english etc you you were fine but tell me what's motivating you why do you want to go to the us and i, I recall my answer which was i thought uh, now when I look at it back, I said, man, this was a strange answer. I said, you know, uh, here we live in Jordan. Uh, we have our own religion, which is different than what's in America. We have a language, which is different. We have a culture. We have ways of life. And I'm pretty sure uh, the Americans don't know about that. We know about how America lives because we have movies, all the movies in the theaters, mostly are from uh, America. So yeah. we know at least from that side. Al Capone? Yeah. Uh, at that time, there was all types of movies. Uh, so we have a chance to see a culture, at least through the eyes of the movies. But I'm pretty sure in America there are no Arab movies or even Jordanian. I don't think in jo Jordan makes movies. So I will be there. I have to let the people know how we live, what we have. So yeah. he said, you want to be an ambassador of culture. Yes. I said, you can call it that way. <laughs> and then he walks out of the room. He tells the attache, he says, I want this boy to be there. <laughs> so they were meeting. I want this boy. Make sure that he, <laughs> he gets the, the, uh, uh, the scholarship or this uh, program. Hmm. So this is how I, I, I was chosen by them at the time, the, the, whoever was behind the program, to come to the U.S. and live with a host family. And he actually also, before he left, he asked, he said, you are coming from a farming family. Would you like to go to be with a farmer or to go to some, I said, no, I would love to be with a, a farmer because I want to see, I can compare. So right. I can compare. If you would send me to somewhere with big industry, car manufacturing, and I knew about Detroit. I said, if you send me to Detroit with all of these, I, I will not be able to compare. Right. I want to go to. So he liked that answer too. That this is, oh, this boy, he knows what he, he wants to do. So I ended up with a farming family uh, down state here in Illinois. Yep. Uh, close to Champaign Urbana. Mm -hmm. So Champaign Urbana looks like it's my. Uh, Second home? 
second dome it's it's like my uh, deterministic future by Allah Azza wa Jal. Oh, this is a place where you will mm. be you will have lots of activities. So my first landing was 20 miles south of Champagne, a small town called Arcola. Later, I, when I came to my PhD, I came to Champagne, Urbana, next to the place where I, I spent one year with, uh, with the family. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can, if I can back up just for a second, you, you so, you you mentioned that your uh, your family was supportive. Your father was supportive of this this type of move. Uh, how was that conversation like? Because to send uh, you know a, a young man from Jordan all the way in the middle of the United States. You know, <laughs> I want to add on to I, 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 You know, if, if you ask, if ask me, I don't even know what type of guts he has to do that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I wouldn't do it now. <laughs> I, that's what I was going to say, because, yeah. like, nowadays, like, <laughs> parents are so on top of their children, they can't even walk down the street. They cannot you know? allow them to go to McDonald's uh, mm -hmm. on the corner yeah. by themselves. Yeah. Uh, I think, again, uh, look, uh, my father, although he came from a village, He was not educated in the school system as much he, his, he reached only seventh grade, kicked out from his job uh, early. So that's an adventure. Uh, built his own, at some point, his magazine uh, with the, to, he took it up to the best level at the, uh, on his own. Built schools, made schools, owned schools when he was not himself educated. He learned the Arabic language uh, based on his father's teaching. So he was teaching Arabic in his own schools without degree, without certificates, but everybody wanted to learn from him. So he's different. Uh, so when that opportunity came, he did not even object. He did not even hesitate. And he encouraged me, he said, just go and uh, be yourself. Remember your father, your mother, your, my grandmother was still alive and that you have a family here. That's all, uh, and do it. And uh, Alhamdulillah, I, I, I passed the, uh, so how, the adventure. <laughs> how was the culture shock? You're this, you know. How old were you? 15? I was 14, and as I said, nine months. I became uh, 15 three months after I arrived right. in September. In fact, my uh, day after tomorrow is today is the third or the second. It's second, I believe. Second, yeah. On the fifth is my. Uh, 66th birthday wow when so, i arrived uh, there i was still i uh, when september the school began i turned 15. i was very 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 uh, i was a boy very young wow, so but uh, i do remember that i did act look and here comes the issue of dawa because uh, the uh, it's an interesting part uh, when i was in my village kids do not pray five times a day regularly. We pray sometimes when the father is at home and he makes the prayer, he calls us, we pray. If he's not there, we don't feel obligated. Juma, we go to Juma, mm -hmm. Friday, that's fine. We fast Ramadan, uh, no delays. Everybody fast Ramadan, even at age of five, we used to fast. Uh, now, when I went to United States and lived with my host family, From day one, I showed them my rug. I have the uh, prayer rug. This is my prayer rug. And I uh, asked them to help me to pinpoint the directions of Mecca. Mm. Why do you want that? I said, this is how we pray. We point to the directions. And then I told them that we have uh, to make wudu, something, the wudu. Uh, And then I made the wudu. <laughs> the, it's very interesting. You know, when you make wudu, we have to wash our feet. Mm -hmm. And we have to blow our nose. Mm -hmm. Now, in America, this is especially the farms. The, these are people who live their uh, uh, very clean life. Mm -hmm. They don't wash their feet in the sink. Mm -hmm. If you want to wash your feet, you take it to the tub, mm -hmm. to the bathtub. And you don't blow your nose in the sink. Mm -hmm. You do it with a oh, handkerchief or with a uh, napkin, and then you throw it. And you c then you can clean your nose, but you don't do. Uh, so they, they made me that note right from the very They saw me making wudu. I, they asked me, what is this? Mm. So I showed them, this is what we do before we pray. They were fascinated. 
He said, oh, we hardly can get our kids to wash their hands once a day. Wow. You wash them five <laughs> times a day, man, that's good. They, they like that. They like the... Were they a Christian family? Oh, yeah. They, they were Christian, uh, non-practicing re- Christians until I came. Okay. And that, I will tell you the, about this. <laughs> yeah. They were not practicing. So when they saw the wudu, then the uh, host mother, her name is Cindy, very nice lady, she said, oh, Muhammad, but uh, I have to tell you, we don't do that in the sink. Uh, I know this is part of your ritual. So when you do the sneezing, first you clean up your nose with the uh, with the napkin mm-hmm. or the, uh, cl- the tissue. Yeah. Uh, and then you just uh, clean and the feet do it in the bathtub, please. Not on the sink. Okay. So I have a quick question about this, right? Because I think I've heard the story, generally speaking, from, from a certain angles. But something that just came to my mind is... What is the mindset of a family that accepts oh. uh, uh, someone yeah, from Jordan? Of, no, oh. no, 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 no. From, from, from the non-Muslim family that, that hosted you, what, what is their mindset that they allowed this to happen? And how much did they know by Islam, right? Because we're talking about the U.S. Zero. U.S. back, back, you know. This was uh, 1972. 1972. 1972. Yeah, what is, what is the perception? You know? oh, zero, zero. In fact, zero about Islam, zero about the Arab countries. Mm. They, they, These are farmers. They used to get together on weekends. They play with motorcycles in the mud. <laughs> These are farmers, big yeah. farmers, very rich farmers. I mm-hmm. mean, the yeah. host family used to own uh, about 10,000 acres. Oh, of okay. land. They farm corn and soybeans. They have motorcycles. They have go-kart. They have everything that I never even imagined. Mm-hmm. But they have zero perception about what's happening there. Mm-hmm. One guy used to tease me, one of their uh, friends. He's a big guy, big man. He says... Ah, Muhammad, I can't imagine how could a camel come across all that and arrive. How long did it take you to arrive here <laughs> on your camel? And I used to, to, uh, uh, to laugh. I know he was kidding, joking. I told him, you have wrong perceptions about camels. Our camels are not like your camels. Your camels walk just like this, slowly. Our camels have wings. <laughs> and they can fly and they can float and you know what when they go into the uh, ocean to cross it they are much faster than the ships I said are you kidding me I said as much as you are kidding me I am kidding you if you continue to ask me about the camels I have to continue to describe our camels for you so so that's uh, they didn't know much hmm. now about prayers Islam fasting, etc. They never knew what is prayer, what is fasting, what are Muslims, what do they do? So their first inception about Islam was me. Mm -hmm. And alhamdulillah, I was able to practice things which I was not even practicing in Jordan. I told them I need to pray and I will pray in my room, not in any other room. They, They have a room for me. And there is a direction. I need to make this wudu, or we call the tahara, uh, the wudu, I need mm. to make that. And they accommodate that. Their only objection was the, uh, where do I wash my feet? And where do I blow my nose? Which is good. That's mm-hmm. a good uh, hygiene. That's fine. I like that. I did not object mm-hmm. to it. I finish my wudu. Once it come to my feet, I go to the bathtub and I do it. Now, uh, the irony is that this family was not uh, committed Christians mm-hmm. who are not practicing. Uh, they go to church on uh, during Christmas time, Thanksgiving time, things, but not on every week, not every Sunday. That's not a priority. Now when they see that I do five times prayer a day, man, they got uh, a little bit competitive. Uh, what do you call that? Uh, motivated. Motivated or. Uh, uh, envy or inspired? Envy, inspired, jealous maybe. Okay, it could be uh, could, different could, motivations. Could be whatever, yes. So they started going to the church and they started to ask me, don't you want to come with us? And of course, yeah, I will. Mm-hmm. I did not have objections uh, to that. So that's fine. So I would go and sit and see what type of prayers they have. They sing, they dance, they talk. Things which are Nothing similar to what we do. Mm-hmm. And I used to be laughing. Sometimes I couldn't even catch myself, I mean, hold myself. It's obvious that I was 
smiling. <laughs> so this uh, doesn't look like a prayer to me. Okay. It looks like a fun type of, of things. Then they would uh, take me into their Sunday school with their kids. Mm -hmm. There is, And of course, they chose the prominent priest. You, they had about three classes at the time. One of them is the, the uh, they call him the minister. The minister of the church is the one who is teaching. And I started asking questions. Back home when I was in Jordan, there was no need to, to, to ask people questions about Allah, about God, mm -hmm. we, or the Quran. We, we believe in it. Now he talks about the sun. Every time we praise be you or we pray to the son, oh, son of God. And I was telling him, who is the son of God? How could a God have a son? Uh, God doesn't have sons. God creates. Mm -hmm. You can say, why does he need to have a son if he can create millions or billions? And those were my thoughts. Mm -hmm. I have not read anywhere about them. So the man, he got a little bit, not upset, but he was afraid for his class mm. to be diverted. Now the kids will start asking questions. Mm. So he asked my family, my host family, uh, you don't have to bring Muhammad anymore <laughs> here. He knows my, uh, lots of stuff, so keep him uh, at home. So mm. now the family started reducing their trips to the church. So I was motivating them <laughs> to go to the church, but then they got <laughs> unmotivated. <laughs> so the so that was, no, no, don't bring him. <laughs> Stay that home. was my first encounter of what we, I would call da'wah today, that this is Islam. Now, Ramadan came. I think uh, by that time, if you look back in the calendar, 1972, I think Ramadan came in September or October, something like this. Uh, uh, Look, it's about 36 years before it uh, rotates. One cycle, yes. So it's uh, close to this time. So I told them now about Ramadan. <coughs> this is what I eat. At dawn, before dawn, I eat sahur. At dawn, at uh, Maghrib, I break my fast. And they were accommodating. So the uh, my host mother, uh, Cindy, she was, as I said, she was really very nice. She prepares my sahur before she goes to bed. Hmm. Puts it on the table. So when I wake up, uh, about 3.30 or 4 o'clock, I find my food there. I eat my uh, breakfast. And they started making their dinner time according to the... Uh, Maghrib. To Maghrib Fatur, Iftar, yes. Uh, they changed their uh, eating uh, timetable. And, 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 and for the audience, what was the duration of this um, tri trip or experience while, while you were living with this family? Was it was like... A year, two years? It's one year. Oh, one, one year. Actually, one year. 11 months exactly. Oh, okay. 11 months. The reason I say 11 months because now I'll tell you that I, I wrote a book after I finished that. I called it 11 months in the United States. Oh, wow. Mm. Okay. At, at age 16. Oh, wow. Uh, and we printed about 100 copies of that. Uh, I will come to back uh, to that later. So the, the uh, Ramadan now, uh, in the school, because I went to high school, now the high school at lunch time there is lunch for all the students and it's you it's prepaid by either your family or by the school. Uh, so now uh, I no longer eat at lunch, but I have my ticket, my coupon. Mm -hmm. So they know why you are not eating. I said, oh, I'm. This is our fasting month. I don't eat. We are fasting. So one of my classmates, his name is Mark. I remember him. He said, Hey, Mohammed. Can I use your ticket? Uh, I need to eat two meals. I said, yeah, sure, you can. So he, he loved that. He said, oh, I wish that you have Ramadan fasting all year. <laughs> that, that guy, he liked the, the fact. Uh, and also, the school, I told them, we don't eat pork. I don't eat pork. Mm -hmm. Why you, you don't eat pork? It's, it's our Islam. So now the school knows I am a Muslim. Mm -hmm. The school knows we have certain restrictions. And they accommodated that on the day when they have a pork, on lunch, they would make me a cheese sandwich. Oh, that's nice. Only. They would, so when they make uh, the pork, so when it's already one day in the week, so I know that day. So they already have my sandwich. I don't have to stand in line. Wow. So that was, in fact, th that friend himself, he said, oh, I wish I don't eat pork either, so I <laughs> don't have to stand in line. <laughs> so, you know, even in the 70s, I feel like this is a experience that every public schooling kid can, can kind of relate to. Yeah, exactly. To. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, so I lived with the, 
Now, one of the other, see, now the public school, the kids in the school, now they started knowing exactly what the strange entity is about. So I was a strange entity. <coughs> He's a Muslim. Uh, and he observes that I observe uh, the uh, my deen, my, uh, and almost absolutely all, except maybe I remember one or two, they appreciated that. For example, I will tell you this uh, issue about when uh, we go to the gym, now the gym is mandatory for the class. Mm -hmm. So we go to the gym and mandatory after the gym, you have to take a shower. So although it's uh, old schools mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. uh, in my village, we never, we, we've never seen, I have never seen a shower. Even at home, we didn't have showers. Mm -hmm. We like bath bucket style. We bath from bucket style. Yeah, mm -hmm. we fill the bucket, mm -hmm. we heat the water and then we mixed it and then we that's what we have no showers so the first time i came across a shower was during my trip so in the gym you have to take a shower and all of the kids they take off all their clothes mm -hmm. so i told the coach the teacher i cannot do that i cannot be in the same place with these people mm -hmm. but he said you have to take a shower i said well at least i will not even uh, do the sport he said no you cannot you have to do the sport i said then you have to accommodate me he said what do you suggest I said, I wait until all finish, when mm -hmm. all the kids finish and get their clothes and leave, mm -hmm. get, get out. Then I go inside. He, and he said, by yourself alone? I said, yes, by myself. And I close the door. And that's how, how, how old were you during this? this oh, I, I still, I'm still, I just turned 15. He, he's still that same uh, 11 months. That yeah, yeah. He's still, to. I'm still in the... I had the same challenge when I was in high school. I was wrestling. So they would, they would, and I love to wrestle, so... I would, uh, whatever that was, the 19, late 90s, I said, well, I'm not going to shower with everybody else. And I'm like, well, you're going to get ringworm and you're going to get infected. So I'd be like, well, no, um, I'll shower after everybody leaves. And that right. was a deal I made. Yeah, that's, but the, you see, to that, it's a village that never had even a clue yeah. about anything. So this, the coach was surprised. Yeah. But then... And actually, when he uh, gave me approval, he said, let's go to the principal. Principal, uh, I forget his name. Very nice man. He said, oh, is this what Muhammad wants? He told him, yes. He said, give him what he wants. This boy should uh, uh, receive all the respect for his religion. Wow. Yeah, okay. that's uh, the principal. Mm -hmm. So he accommodated me, so I started showering alone by myself. And then some of my friends, they used to say, oh, we wish we can do that. We just have yeah. a shower by the, by ourselves. Said, well, you have to be Muslim to do that. <laughs> yeah. You have to be Muslim to, to do that. And even the, the person who said about the uh, not eating pork so that he get his sandwich before everybody else, yeah. I told them there is a price for that. You have to be, to be a Muslim uh, to get this treatment. Yep. So these were first encounters. And then the people the students, they knew there is a kid around the corner who is different than us. Yeah, something's different about yeah. this guy. And uh, one thing I want to bring up is that uh, many people could have been in that particular situation and despite facing um, different circumstances, despite just going along with the flow and doing mm -hmm. what people around you are doing, mm -hmm. you know, subhanAllah, like you're, you're taking a stand and you're, you're speaking up for yourself. And yeah. this is something that... Uh, even today, many of the youth that are up and coming, they have a problem doing that. Well, although there are many of them, not only single There's ones. There's many of them there now. could be in the school, same school, maybe 10, 15, 20 uh, Muslims. Right. So, so yeah. uh, can you get a little bit more into that? Uh, what, what was that psych psychology and mindset behind? Oh, know? the every time I face something this, immediately jump to my memory. I am a Muslim. My father is a Muslim. My mother is a Muslim. And my grandmother, who was also teaching all of us, who are Muslims, no way in the world I would violate what I have learned from them. That's it was almost I to the extent I used to come to my mind sometimes. What if these people will reject or force me to do something? Oh, immediately comes to my thought. I have the phone number of the office in New York. I have their mail address. I will write them, I'm going back. Mm -hmm. That's my uh, uh, my alternative. Right. So it's, it's not, no return. No return. So this was uh, uh, 
very uh, subhanallah uh, maybe it's not it's not my power i am a kid but allah azza wa jal uh, provides guidance to whomever he wishes in allah yahdi man yasha i believe in that wholeheartedly uh, i started being invited during ramadan for dinners to eat dinners with people now some of them they didn't know exactly that my dinner is at sunset so whenever somebody says could you come for us to eat supper at our house i said sure but remember this is what i eat at this time i cannot do that before later i can i can wait it's okay can drink some water but but don't make dinner before the sunset okay one of the families that invited me they happened to cook pork at the time and i thought that my family that i lived with told them that muhammad doesn't eat pork mm-hmm. so when i arrived there i already smelled something then i told the uh, the person who was with me in the classroom that's who was the reason to invite me so it looks like you guys are cooking something porky <laughs> Yeah. Uh, he said, yeah, we are having the uh, ribs. I said, look, tell your mother I don't eat this stuff. This is uh, prohibited. I am a Muslim. So immediately they stopped doing that. They got around it. They cooked another meal. Cheese sandwich? Huh? Cheese no, sandwich? No, they, they, cooked, they, they had uh, beef or whatever. They, uh, and hamburgers. They did some things. But immediately they changed. Yeah. And uh, and I did not have any hesitance to tell them this is what I would do. Right. So that I, I will not eat this and I will not even sit on the table where, where there is pork. Well, I, I, so I want to take this opportunity to like let our audience know that whether it's you know young girls have feeling stigma to wear hijab, that this is a struggle that um, yeah. Dr. Jelani, you know, encountered in the 70s or whatever what year 72. was it? 72 72 completely alone you know alone. completely alone and no in probably the, probably the only muslim in, the in only, illinois the only muslim in that village and there are other villages around it right. the whole area the only muslim i was there was right. no other muslim without his family without his yeah. family so and, uh, you know get that strength from allah make your connection yeah. with allah and you know allah will guide you yeah. and you know just as he guided and he'll, he'll strengthen uh, Dr. you and, and uh, I was invited to speak at churches. Mm-hmm. I think I spoke three or four times. I spoke at the church. I spoke at 4H Club. Mm-hmm. 4H Club, which is almost secular, this is. They invited me. And I've never talked about Islam. So I prepared with whatever I know from my kids' background, which was little, wrote something. I wrote some my speech and actually I gave speeches at churches at 4H club and there was also another club for the farmers they invited me and and it used to be formal you know you go to mm-hmm. give a lecture the first time I wore a jacket and a tie so my family there they said you cannot go just like this with jeans and you, you need a jacket and a tie and i think once we finish i'll show you a photo one of the photos if i i think i have it somewhere uh, inshallah yeah. hey, let me if you want to share it i can put it in the post production huh? i can you want to share it no let me ask you a question yeah we'll probably get that in the editing yeah. but let me ask you a question so were you doing this type of stuff back in back home in jordan like you know giving speeches and no never uh you know oh, uh, like, like were you doing similar activities <clears throat> yes well in jordan I tell you, I used to give speeches at the school. Okay. In the morning, there is uh, there was a, like a ritual at the school or a, a culture. When all the kids line up, we used to line up outside in the in the, uh, in the yard. Yeah. And then the the uh, teachers they s- select someone who is willing to speak to give a speech. I used to do that on a weekly basis. I used to. Even when I was my seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh before I came to the U.S., uh, I started doing that. And many of the speeches were either inspired by teachers, or by my father, or by my own 
reading at the time. So I had no problem giving speeches. I was used to it. I would stand up in front of all the teachers and the uh, kids, stand, the kids standing up. Teachers could be sitting on chairs. But I would stand for 10, 15 minutes and give a talk. Uh, and sometimes I would give a talk orally without even writing. Sometimes I write my speech and I consult my father. He tells me what's wrong, how to rephrase or do something. So that I had no problem with it. Yep. But in English, now when I came here, I had to speak English. So I was able to write my stuff and talk in a manner convincing, about trying to bring every idea that can convince the people that my religion is right. I was not just telling them what we do. I was telling them, this is how it should be. Mm -hmm. And uh, my host family used to tell me, oh, Muhammad, you stress it a lot. Uh, stress it means uh, on the people. Look, this is the right way to do it. And I talk about Trinity mm -hmm. to them in the church. This is God cannot have children. God cannot have father. And I translate, Qul Allahu Ahad. Allah is one. So that was, I think, the making up of the da'wah career. That year, I know we went from Jordan to the U.S., 10 people. I plus other nine, four boys and five girls. Each and every one returned back as secular as you could think. Mm. And were they all in one area or, or spread throughout they the country? They spread all over. Okay. Mm. Some of them in Louisiana, New York, California, etc. I came to Illinois, to the Midwest, to the mm. farming. Nice family. But hey, look, this is a huge culture. Mm. Yeah. Uh, culture, and it, it, it grinds you. Uh -huh. It's not, uh -huh. it grinds you. There are, there are parties every day. Temptations, day. yeah. Parties every week for, for kids. There are parties at the school. There are fights, there are uh, drugs, there are all types of things. Uh, even then, it was the time of the hippies. Yep. All oh, right. That's, that was the hippies time. Sexual revolution. And yeah, sexual revolution. You, can't, you cannot be a boy without a girlfriend. You cannot right. be a girl without boyfriend. This is absolutely... Strange. It's strange. It's not acceptable. Yep. And this is something that they used to bombard me with all the time. Yeah. Uh, where is your girlfriend? And my... Uh, host family, they used to say, oh, maybe you cannot get one. Let's try to help you. <laughs> yeah. wow. uh, uh, that's, so it, it, it's the, that's the, 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 the era. Uh, Fifteen years later, back in 84, 85, something, came the AIDS pandemic. Yeah. So people started being a bit more careful. So <coughs> I, when I came back later, so it was a different era. But the 70s, late 60s, hippies, long hair, don't bath, do whatever you want, yep. go and sleep in the street, mm -hmm. uh, leap, sleep with whomever you want. Even the uh, lesbians, gays were starting then, that's the LGBT stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was then, it's not new. Then it was cool yeah. to be gay, cool. And uh, during that era specifically, oh. mm -hmm. uh, the only time it, there was a bit Stigma. Tightening yeah. when the AIDS came up, and yep. they said AIDS was because of this homosexuality. Mm -hmm. It only transmits through ho homosexuals. That's the 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 first notion about mm. it. So people started watching out their behavior. But in the seventies, that was almost no rule. It's absolutely lawless society, lawless country. Yep. So to live through that and to stick to your ideas that is a big test yeah if you do it then you start thinking okay can i propagate that yeah <coughs> or not that's where the whole issue of dawah comes in yeah. so that was my uh, uh, in brief a story and as i said when i came back home after a year i was talking to my father about my experience look my father didn't know much about my experience because the correspondence was through mail, letters. Mm. And the letters take uh, almost three to four months to come, go back and forth. Yep. I send the letter, takes almost ha one and a half months to be there, takes about a week or so to write back in the, the, through the mail. So about four months yep. before you get a response. 
probably throughout the whole time, I got three or four letters from my yeah. father, and he got the same from me. So they don't know much. So now he asked, and we talked about it with my brothers, with everybody. He said, you have to sit down and write a book. I said, yeah. write a book? I never thought about writing a book. So when you mentioned that book. So he said, yeah, yeah, you have to write all of this because you will forget it. So he, uh, uh, I brought with me from America a typewriter mm. at that time. Now, this is my host family knew that I have, I have knowledge, I have things. And they brought me for my birthday on September 5th, 1972, uh, a typewriter. And the mother, she said, look, you have something that I don't think our kids, all the school, they have it. You need a typewriter. Learn. And she taught me how to type with all the four hands. Yeah. She gave me the lessons right. at the time, which is... I, I never even uh, I've never seen a typewriter before right. so I started typing <laughs> so when I went home my father saw I do have a typewriter he said okay I will get you papers write your story yeah. yeah and and then I called that 11 months in the USA it's about 30 40 pages uh, from, manuscript huh? uh, 30 40 pages uh, and you pr printed that out the, uh, long pages which is 8 by 11 mm -hmm. page Printed, we printed hundred copies. And your father believed in you. He, he, oh yeah, he, uh, he gave you the task, and he believed it. You know, like he definitely, yeah, definitely, he believed, and he trusted everything I said. Never questioned anything. He never uh, provoked me about uh, activities which are, uh, let's say, alcohol, drinking, uh, womanizing, etc. He believed every word I said. He gave me that uh, confidence again and the trust so this was trip number one can I, can I pause you right there and I, I hate to interrupt your flow but uh, one thing I want to emphasize and we were talking about this the other day at that time you knew uh, you mentioned you knew maybe only a few surahs at that time from the Quran you, 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 you understood some of the fundamentals of Islam and this is what you're talking yeah. about yes. to, to the people when you're presenting yes. so I, I just want to emphasize for, for, for the audience and, and uh, obviously a reminder for myself first and foremost is that you, you are responsible for whatever you know, even if it's very little bit. And that is what you have to understand and propagate. Yes. And, uh, and, and, and in fact, you brought this, these examples uh, to us the power before. Power of Tawheed, too. Yeah. Power the, of Tawheed, yeah. the, the, Tawheed, just understanding Tawheed properly is so powerful. That's enough. That's, that's enough, yeah. yeah. That's enough. So, in, in fact, if you know the fundamentals, you don't have an excuse. And, and, and uh, many of the things I'm telling you now, you taught, you taught and mentioned to us when you talked about the early companions like... Uh, right. Um, like Bilal radiallahu an, what he said, Ahad and that was that's his. All he, he knew. That's all he knew, and the companions yeah. that were martyred in the beginning, that's all they knew. So we can't <coughs> use that as an excuse for us today, yes. we, saying that we don't know. What do we? What, right. what do you mean that you don't know? And it's it's really uh, nobody cares about how much you know. Look, people care about how much you portray of what you know how much that shows up on your personality, how much comes out on your face, uh, on your uh, activities, on your... So you are not hypocrite. You are mm. not just... Uh, uh, you are not a carrier of knowledge on your back. In fact, this is what the Quran says. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلُوا التَّوْرَاتَ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُوا أَسْفَارَ Those who carry the Torah on their backs, they take it just like a donkey who is carrying tons of books on his back. Mm -hmm. What's the use? And today we have those. We have those who carry the knowledge on their backs, on their tongues. They talk about it. They know the Quran inside out. But at the end of the day, they become uh, servants of the tyrants. Yeah. What's the, what's the, the purpose? So, that's, so, uh, so that year, I think, was the first really mark that had composed uh, a vision of a da'wah carrier. Transformational. Yeah, I, I didn't know the word da'wah carrier then. I did not know the terms as I know them today, but that was it. I stood up for ideas that I believed in. I stood it, uh, up, I defended them, I portrayed them, I showed them, and I lived with them. 
although in an environment that was, I was absolutely alone, absolutely, in terms of Islam. I never hesitated to talk about my deen, my values, my rituals, my beliefs. Never, never, never. You weren't even a minority, you were just one. Yeah. But despite that, the help of Allah was there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Now, let me go to the next level. Mm -hmm. If you, yeah. if, you, if you don't mind, before yeah, you get let, let's move, let's move. <laughs> yeah, let's we got, we're like in an hour, and okay. we've got okay. another yes. hour. So, so I want to get to at least we, we Uzbekistan. Need, we need four or five yeah, yeah, hours I need to more, more do this sessions. Yeah. You can't do it at uh, one time. Okay, okay. Go, but ahead. go ahead. No, no, it's, it's fine. We'll, yeah, see, then when I came to Jordan, I spent one more year in high school. So I, so that year, which I, I did that year, was my senior high school mm -hmm. in the U.S., but in Jordan, they did not admit it as senior because I skipped a year. The 11th grade was skipped. I was in the U.S. and in the U.S. they uh, they put me in the class of the 12th grade. So I got my diploma. I got my actual high school diploma. So in Jordan, they said, no, 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 you have to do the diploma again. That's You skipped a year. Okay, that's fine. So I was in the school now. Now in the school in Jordan, this is high school, and again, although Jordan has Muslims, but the majority are non-practicing Muslims. So in the school, in the high school when, where I went to, it's a collection of kids coming from all types of villages compiled in one place. So that first thing I demanded a place to pray in. No, we don't have a place to pray in. Subhanallah, isn't that crazy? Yeah, yeah. I, then I went to the to the principal. I said, look, I just came from America. They gave me a room for myself every day. I pray dhuhr there. What do you mean you don't have a room for prayer here? And this is the same across the Muslim world, especially yeah, yeah. in that time. Yeah. So he, he was astonished. He said, really, you did that? I said, yeah, I did. And the first day I was at the school, I told the principal, I need a room where I can pray. And no one should bother me for that. He said, okay, we'll give you a room. So he gave me a room in the, uh, at the high school in, uh, in the city of Erbid, which is this collection of all the villages around. Then I started in my class at the time, time of Dhuhr, when the Dhuhr prayer comes in, I say, I'm going to pray. Who's coming? At the beginning, I had one person coming with me. By the time we finished, we had that room being filled three or four times for the whole prayer. They come and pray. Our kids. Because they all were shy. They think it's it, it's a shame as a young kid to come and and pray. So that was now that that was the impact of what I learned in, in the USA. So I came back to Jordan. So that was my second step in the formulation of my personality. Now, as this is my deen, this is my Islam, it should be there. Step, step by step, Allah SWT is preparing yeah. you. Step by step. And that's, I will skip that part in Jordan because uh, uh, it was straightforward. One encounter, then everything smooth. On a daily basis, that becomes regular work. And I started reading more. When I came back, I looked into the books of my father, the, his library, mm -hmm. the old books, the, we call them the yellow books. Mm -hmm. The yellow, which are yellow books, actually, these are good books. These are the yellow pages, the pages that they never worn out. They stay two, three hundred years as if they are printed today. Are they like the heat impacted the heat? Yeah, but these were papers at the time, they were genuine. Okay. Genuine. That's not trash. It's not recycled stuff which uh, get. Uh, like if you write something on a pair, pair print any pay, page mm -hmm. today, come a few months later, to, you will find it uh, bad already. So once I finished that high school year, uh, I was marked one of the first 10 in the whole country. I got my score. We have this called national uh, exam. Mm -hmm. uh, it's most of the countries. Uh, except in the United States, they have this national exam mm -hmm. for all students to take it at once. And this is 
the exam that decides which college you can go to, whether you can win a scholarship or not. So I got my, uh, I was, although I was away for one year from the school system, I had the school system in the U.S., but I was able to catch up. I got one of the highest 10 top students in the country. Uh, and then I won a scholarship to the Soviet Union this time. Oh, wow. <laughs> from, from one camp to the other yeah. camp? Huh? So this is... <laughs> and and uh, now I already know that Soviet Union is the anti-Americans. Right. I knew Cold it from, War. Yeah, I knew it from my studies in America. Mm -hmm. uh, I took a history class and there they talked about Russia, mm -hmm. Soviet Union, the war, the Cold War, the nuclear uh, race. So I was uh, educated by that from the uh, did you school. Did you feel it, though, back then? Like, did you feel the effects of the Cold War even in uh, Jordan? In, in, in Jordan? In, oh, yeah, not in Jordan. No. In Jordan, we have the hot war because with the uh, Israelis and the Jews mm, in Palestine, okay. there was a hot war. So we, that's different. But the Cold War in the United States, it was a daily talk in the school. It was always on TV. It was always on movies. So it was really a cold war in practice. You could hear it, you could see it, you could talk about it. Uh, uh, people take Russia and the so they call it Russia. They never call it the Soviet Union there. Russia, they take it seriously and they have this fear about a nuclear war because they have done it. They knew what a nuclear warfare can do. Yeah. They have bombed uh, Japan with it. So they know uh, how much impact it could have. Uh, so I learned a lot about the Eastern camp from the American perspective. Now, when I won a scholarship to the Soviet Union, I had a choice. I could have resented that. So no, I don't want to go to the Soviet bloc. But I thought it was a good uh, opportunity to go to the Soviet Union to study medicine. So that's my, because usually if you get the highest grade, they give you the highest level of education. Right, possible. they give you the best So the best is medical. Everybody wants to go into medicine. Somehow in me, I like engineering. But because of my grade, I said, okay, I deserve it, so I better do it. So I went <laughs> and I got the scholarship for medical school because I thought it's my right. I don't want to give up my right. So I, in, uh, in, uh, August 1974, so I, I was back to Jordan 1973 from the uh, United States. One year spent in Jordan and then immediately to the Soviet Union. 1974, July, I think July 1974, I was in the plane heading to Soviet Union. Uh, so that makes it July 1974, how old I was, I was 57 to 74, I was 17 years old, less than 17, I was 16 years old and uh, 11 and 10 months. Right, you mentioned you, right, right, you mentioned you graduated early yeah. from high school, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's what uh, I was when I went to the Soviet Union. Now, in the Soviet Union, it's totally different. And really quick, since you w were in America, <clears throat> did you did you incline towards any, because um, obviously the whole world, world was in like a Cold War yeah. camps. D did you or Jordan incline towards any particular camp? Did you feel it like in that in that sense? In Jordan, no, you, do, you don't feel that, but you feel that this is a westernized country. Mm, it's okay. about the West. In fact, the notion about Russia or the Soviet Union never shows up in our uh, classes, our schools. What shows up? In fact, we have uh, a whole chapter in history about the uh, civilization of Europe, about the rise of Europe, mm -hmm. uh, and then the coming uh, of the United States. But nothing about Russia, not, nothing about the Soviet Union, nothing about socialism. So now, now, first hand, I learned what capitalism is. Not theoretically, but practically. Practically, capitalism, in fact, as 
when I was in the States, uh, here is one event. My host father, his name is David, he took me on one of his trips to the bank, to his bank where he uh, stashes his money. So the, uh, and he intro introduces me to the, uh, to the, to the uh, manager of the bank, okay. the branch. And that manager, he says, oh, so this is the, uh, he tells his, the man, so this is the kid that's living with you. I said, yes. He told me, do you know who's this guy about David? I said, yeah, he's the person I live with. He said, no, 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 you don't know him. He's the guy, if he withdraws his money from our bank, we will go bankrupt. Wow, that is interesting. Yeah, he <laughs> said, he, if he pulls out his money, he goes to another bank, we will be all broke here. So the, you have to, <laughs> to know who is he. So this is, the, and then uh, he says, we in the bank, we finance all, whatever he wants, we finance it. So the first time I heard the word financing was then. Now, jump ahead from that time, maybe 15 years later, is it 72, 86, 14 years later, when I, when I was in America the next time, that big money that he had, it was all gone. All gone. Why? Because there were two years in a row, it was drought in okay. the United States, drought. And he could not pay the fees to the bank, the interest of the loans that he got. So there the bank took all his land. Oh man, repossessed. Repossessed. And I put that in my book about capitalism. This is what, if you recall that, you will go and see that this is what capitalism. But then I did not see that because he was still working. His tractors, his combines, his uh, machineries, uh, all of it was, was uh, up and running. And they were giving him loans after loans, and he pays the interest every year and whatever uh, small installments. He pays that because he has lots of uh, products. The moment you fail to do that, no mercy. You are dead. And he, he lost his land, he lost his wife, he lost his family, he lost everything, and he migrated to the south somewhere where he was able to work as in a farm without telling the people that he was himself a big farmer. SubhanAllah. Yeah. <coughs> Total life this is dramatically capitalism. shifted. So, so, so now, now you're telling us. Uh, you, so, you were you were in America. You, you, you uh, in a capitalistic society, uh, predominantly Judeo-Christian in, mm. in its values. And now, you're going over to uh, a university in the Soviet Union, communistic. Um, you're, you're going to Russia at that time. Mm. So, tell tell us how uh, tell us now what's unique to that uh, particular society and and uh, a little yeah. bit about your studies over there. Sure. Uh, first of all, I said I want to study medicine. Yes, and then uh, two months in the in the college, I uh, reverted back to my uh, real ambitions and my likes, so I switched to engineering, and I uh, told the principal or the president of the university then, look, I was sent here on a scholarship on medicine. I want to switch to engineering. He said, but this is the best future. It's doctor. I said, I don't, I don't want that. I, I I'm an engineer. I want to be an engineer, and want use my math skills uh, so he gets permission he had to get the permission from Jordan government tell them look you sent someone uh, to medical school now he wants to switch he uh, then I got the the, uh, the uh, agreement and they switch they transferred me to another city uh, where I could uh, be an engineer and the good thing about that which I <laughs> I never anticipated. I, th I thought I was just switching from college to college, but I switched to another city and they, trans they transferred me to the capital city of Azerbaijan, Baku, which is a Muslim place. At least used to be a Muslim place. And this was, so just so our audience understands, uh, because now Russia is, you know, uh, from from like a border standpoint, the way it is. Azerbaijan was. But Azerbaijan at that time was, was part. Was part of the Soviet okay, Union. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All the Muslim Central Asian and Azerbaijan and uh, Kavkaz and Tatarstan, all of them were part of the Soviet Socialist Republic, Communist, whatever. So 
so I got the chance now, which is, uh, that's the grace of Allah. And then, then that's where I know that Allah Azza wa Jal really is guiding my steps. It's the best me. of planners. It's the best uh, planner. So I moved to Azerbaijan, uh, Baku. And on the first day I was in Azerbaijan, I met a person who was in charge of accommodating me to the dorm, etc. His name is Ali. He's a Muslim. Uh, Ali, I think his, I forgot what his last name was. So we started chatting with the little Russian I have learned in the, the past two months. In the two months I spent in the medical school, I learned a few sentences, words, I started talking. So now this guy, he already sees, because we slept, I, I was with another friend, maybe for about 15, 16 hours. So when we woke up, the first thing I, when I woke up, I told the person, where is the washroom I need to make wudu and pray? So he was so happy. And he hugged me. He said, man, I have never seen anyone asking to pray other than my father before he died. The only one he ever saw praying was his father, but his father passed away. So now we are little kids, I myself and my friend from Jordan. We want to pray. So he loved that and he gave us the best help we could, uh, we could need on our first day. So he allocated us to a, uh, to a room, which is a good room, clean room in a dorm. Their dorms were absolutely dirty, absolutely impossible. You cannot even live. This was Soviet Union. It, it was a trash type of country. It doesn't care about the plight of the people, doesn't care about hygiene, doesn't care about anything. You live just as you, you can survive. Make that picture for us. Like, like, how did it feel living there? Oh, at the beginning. Yeah, like, uh, what does that? What does that mean? Do, are there trash services in the country? Are there any basic yes. system systems? I'll tell you Are there more, standards yeah. and regulations? Yeah. The uh, number one, the dorms, dorms are mixed, boys and girls. Mm -hmm. The bathrooms are mixed. Really, all the yeah. time. Uh, bathrooms are dirty. Mm -hmm. No one cleans them up. Now you have to go and clean your seat if you go. Wow. It doesn't matter who was before you. Uh, at that time, it was absolutely trashy. I mean, it's disgusting. Wow. Uh, and many of our colleagues at the time, students, they wanted to return back the same day. Wow. And uh, so when I, mo and that was my first landing was in Zaporozhia, which is today in the in the war. Uh, yeah, yeah, Zaporozhia, yeah, yeah. That's when I went to the, that was where the medical school I went to. So we fled from there to Baku. Baku was even worse. Oh, wow. Uh, because uh, nobody cared about the people, dorms, etc. You just have to make up your living. So we have to, we had to make up like uh, a camp within the dorm so we can sustain hygiene and the cleanness, etc. You literally had to create a municipal government. We have you have to create a municipal government inside the inside the dorm itself. Wow. Yes, and and we did, we did. Uh, uh, now, uh, I know I cannot accept that. I lived in the U.S. I know how clean it was. I knew how the how people showered after every uh, uh, every gym on every day. You take a shower in the morning when you wake up before you go to school. That was the norm. And you take a shower in the uh, in the uh, gym class in the class in mm -hmm. the gym. And when you go before you go to bed, you take a shower, three mm -hmm. showers a day. Mm -hmm. Wow! Okay. That was the so I came from this U.S. That's the life standard. Yeah. Uh, to the Soviet Union, where you can in the Soviet Union the shower, the shower they have in the dorm, the only shower. It's a big hole like this here, uh -huh. open, and there are the Shower is coming from the uh, ceiling, ceiling yeah. uh -huh. uh, about maybe 20 or 30 of them, they are coming. You just come and find a spot, you say, you stand beneath that, and next to you, you don't know who. 
It could be a woman, it could be a boy, it could be wow, it could be, it could wow. be anything. Wow. It could be anything. It, was that was that how uh, you know just for understanding is it was that how the Russia or Soviet Union was before communism or was that that was during communism? Was it because of communism? It was oh built yes, before in... com- because communism comes and says, look, there is no difference between genders, no difference. You are just material being. There is nothing called the human You're or just matter. You are matter. Wow. Just a matter being able to express yourself with your tongues. The donkey expresses uh, himself with his uh, shouting out, but it's different expression. I want to take that opportunity to highlight to the audience, this is how ideas matter. How the, your political concepts yeah. of life, they manifest in real ways. Of course. And if you know, you think that the, the root ideas of capitalism are like you know they're not manifesting and corrupting your life in a in a way right now in reality no no it is that's why the ideological is first and foremost how you what you believe and how you carry your ideas will manifest in the rest of your society yeah and you know. well, uh, i don't want to portray that the life in the u.s was uh, perfect because i just mentioned right. i lived with a farmer for a year was multimillionaire, yeah. because and the, and the guy in the bank he said if he, this guy withdraws his money we will be broke, mm. but 10, 12, 12 years later, that same man was broke and mm. the bank took over his lands mm. and he was, he, he was trashed now. Mm. And his life was destroyed. Family. Was, his life was destroyed. His wife uh, uh, turned against him and his kids. Mm. His wife married some another person. He got married. He. Flew away with another woman and to, hmm. to have a living. Anyway, so this is that's the differ, that's the other side of the coin. Yeah. But in Russia and the Soviet Union, the quality of man or this notion of a human does not exist. Does not exist literally. So yeah. that's why I tell you, in the bathroom, no, bathrooms, in the school and the university, there are uh, there are seats, which are next to each others. Next to each other, what? and they're open. Yeah. What? Yeah. They're open. Look. And China uh, had and, too. I, and I will, for me, for example, because I could not uh, go to a bathroom in public, in public places like this, until I go home and find, clean up the seats and the doors of my bathroom. I, within a year, I, uh, I got uh, an appendicitis. I had to be operated <laughs> on. As a result of that, I know that's where because uh, cuts, you were holding anticipated it. holding yeah, all the yeah, time yeah. with all types of microbes. Right. So, so this is from the uh, lifestyle. Oh, so good. with the uh, with the showers now, now uh, we made a campaign. Uh, me and the brothers uh, that lived there, we went to the uh, uh, actually to the dorm. Nobody would uh, would care about us. So what we decided. We will go as a block of people mm-hmm. at s- certain time at the dawn mm-hmm. to take shower. Everybody takes a shower only at the dawn, mm-hmm. and then we will have the uh, brothers who stay outside. They will guard the door. They will not allow anyone to enter. Mm. So you go and take a shower, come back. Then the next one goes, and you uh, protect him. Mm-hmm. So that's how we we managed. And as you said, it's a municipality. It's a government. Right. We made our own rules and our own governments. By force. Right. If somebody comes in, a boy or a girl wants to take a shower, we'll just kick him out. You cannot right. enter. Right. Yeah. You want to fight, we'll fight, but you cannot. Wow. So that's that's how we uh, survived one phase of the life before we were able to make, uh, to find different ways. But you cannot live outside a dorm. You have to live in the dorm of the, of the government. Right, because you're a foreign student. Yeah. Foreign students, yes. Uh, and also... Russian students or Soviet students mm-hmm. who are coming from different villages, they had to live in the dorm. Oh, okay, okay. Because dorm is controlled. Okay, okay. Now, it's controlled also not in the way you live. In each room that students live in, they will have a radio hanging on the wall. Mm-hmm. But that radio was two ways, it's not one way, which means whatever you speak, they will hear it. Mm. And when you open it up, the only things that the only station comes the government stations that tells you news how bad the United States and capitalism is. Mm-hmm. So start control. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Now, how do we know that this was a, this was a, a, a two-way radio? That means they are listening to you. Because sometimes 
we tried this. I said, okay, I will cut the wires of the radio. I don't want to hear the radio. Yeah. Okay, you just cut the wire so it's uh, no longer connected. So within 24 hours, the maintenance guy shows up to fix the radio. So, oh, your radio is not working. We have to. Fi what do you mean it's not working? How do you know that I'm not listening? They're not getting feedback. Because they are not getting the feedback. Wow. So this is how, how terrible it was. So this is the first impressions of the Soviet Union. Now. And that's just how this is, how it's becoming. They're watching literally everything. Yeah, like yeah. Your feed, your... Now, in the classrooms, classrooms, you have to take the communist culture every day. There is, there is a, a class. Mm -hmm. Every semester, there is a different class. Class is starting from what is communist, what's communism, what's the communist party, what does it do, what's his, its history, who is Lenin, who is Marx, who is Engels, who is all of this, what's the material being. It's all there. Now, here comes now our role as Dawa careers. Mm -hmm. Now, I already formulated my personality. I started reading. Now, it's unlike the uh, time when I was in the US. Now, a year before I came to the Soviet, I read tens of books. Then I brought with me tens more. And I was reading, reading. I was reading Maududi, Sayyid Qutb, mm -hmm. Nabhani. I was reading as much as I can. So now in the classrooms, the professor comes and teaches communism. Not the father, the son, and the... Now, no father, no son, mm -hmm. <laughs> no spirit. Right. There they say there is a father and a son, right. a spirit. Is no one. All are matter. So I used to challenge. Mm -hmm. Every class, I would stand up to the professor, ask him questions, very deep questions, until he approached me. He said, Muhammad, I don't want you in my class. I don't want you. Same thing would, like the preacher. Yeah, <laughs> I would, but, and here is the, here's the deal, he, said, he told me. He was a good guy. His name is David Diktiar. He's a Jewish, uh, supposedly communist. But mm -hmm. he, he said, here is the deal. I said, what's the deal? He said, I will give you an A in the course. You don't have to show up. And usually, <laughs> the A, usually they give us at the beginning of the class mm -hmm. a book mm -hmm. uh, or a booklet. This book has the grades, right. final grades. He said, bring me your book. I'll sign it right now. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an A. A is a five out of five. That's yeah. five. Excellent. A, whatever. And don't show up on my class. <laughs> I said, but I like your class. He said, but I don't like you in my class. <laughs> he told me. Did he feel like his, uh, he, he was being challenged and he couldn't defend it? Did he feel he, like his mm, beliefs were threatened or did he feel like you're going to get in trouble because of no, this? No, 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 no. He, he was uh, uh, worried about the kids. Well, he's not worried about himself. Okay. He's a philosopher. He knows the philosophy inside out, etc. And he, and, and he told me, he said, look, if you really want to challenge the ideas, uh, I will come to your room and we'll talk. Mm -hmm. We'll talk as much. I said, yeah, I love that. Please uh, the come. isolation strategy. Yeah. But please, please stay away from my students. Mm -hmm. I think the, the uh, KGB, they told them, look, these are, this man is, in, this boy is impacting our students. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't let, let him do that. And it did because after the class, every time we finish, we go to the cafeteria or somewhere to sit. All the students, they surround, they come to me. Mm -hmm. How do you learn that? Where did you get this from? Mm. How could you speak like this? Uh, let's ask you questions. Mm. And they were, and many of them were from Muslim backgrounds, uh, these uh, kids. Now, I skipped something. I just want to mention there is, because each and every one really a type of challenge that's interesting. When we finished the first year in Baku, which is uh, supposedly a Muslim country or a Muslim uh, area city uh, and during that that year I did exactly what I did in in the other city which I will mention now uh, the Communist Party and the group responsible for the uh, for the university were absolutely disturbed and annoyed and they don't like me they and I was pushing it to the limit, mm. pushing to the limit. 
I was trying to, every party they made, which belonged to the Communist Party, I made every possible step to block it or to block our students from going there. Mm. And not to participate and to talk about this is haram, this is against Islam, this is blah, blah, mm. blah, etc. Mm. And many students there responded to me. Mm -hmm. Even Christian students, not only Muslim, from Jordan and from Arab countries and from Pakistan and from others. They were from all over the world. So at the end of the year, they had to distribute the students. Now we were, this is called prepar preparatory year. You learn Russian language, you learn something about your engineering or mm -hmm. uh, specialty. But then they send you now finally to the institute or the university where you will spend the rest of your five years. Mm -hmm. So this is one year. So I finished in Baku. The last, once we got our diplomas the fir for the first year, our certificates, now they want to distribute us. And they get, called us one by one and they told me, uh, we decided to send you to Tashkent. Tashkent. Tashkent, which is the capital of Uzbekistan. In, uh, in another session. Yeah. When, uh, when they said you, and uh, two more friends who were three, I mean, from Jordan, mm -hmm. and, there, and there are many other. You and the other two, you were going to Tashkent. Now, Tashkent is known to be quality-wise in the teaching institutes, not as good as Moscow. Everybody else was sent to Moscow. Mm. I mean, now, we, we were sent to Tashkent. I told them, looks, this looks like a punishment rather than uh, a graduation. Mm. He said, you consider it the way you want, you know how you behave. Mm. He was very, very rude. Wow. That was the dean. Trying to get rid of you. Yeah, he, he, he just want to piss me off, mm. send you to Tashkent. I didn't respond a lot. I said, okay, that's fine. And at that night, there was supposedly a graduation party mm. where the rector of the university comes in and he provides the rewards for students and talks about this, how this year was wonderful and we graduated you and you are now uh, ambassadors of the United, of the Soviet Union to the world. Okay, this garbage. So he talked about all of this stuff. And once he finished, he mistakenly maybe, he asked for comments. Anybody wants to, or to talk, to mention. <laughs> Immediately I jumped over to the table. So of course I want to. He said, okay, he didn't know the story. Mm. Then I told him, well, thank you for your, uh, and we definitely will be ambassadors, but you will not know what message we will carry. You can designate me as ambassador, but you cannot control what I'm going to speak. Mm. He was surprised. He said, look, look at this. You, he, the dean was sitting next to him. Mm. He said, look at this dean here, your dean. I got the first grade in this whole among all the international students. Mm -hmm. I'm the highest grade. Mm -hmm. I'm number one here. And I'm by your own laws, I have the right to choose where do I go, which institute. You will give me a list of 100 institutes and I'll tell you I will go here. This man, he calls me and he says, you are going to Tashkent. Why? Because he thinks Tashkent is a trash. And he wants to trash me there. But let him know. He was sitting there, Dean. Mm -hmm. I did not talk to Dean. I said, please tell this man that if he gave me the list, I would have chosen Tashkent. And let him ask me why, which I am sure he will not ask me. Because Tashkent, like Baku, is a Muslim country. That's where our people came to this place and made it a Muslim country more than 1,300 years ago. The first rise of Islam after the time of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the conquest of Central Asia. This is my land. This is my people. Mm -hmm. I will only go there. I don't give a damn about Russia or about Moscow or about your women <laughs> or about alcohol <laughs> that you think I am. I am going to that place. I love my people. Yeah, and you will hear about me. Yeah. He was so shocked. And he told the dean, did you do that? Yeah. The dean, of course, he knows that he did that. So he didn't say anything. He said, I am going there. If my colleagues, the other two colleagues, wants to go with me, they can. But it's their right to choose wherever they want. Give them the right to choose. I already chose 
Tashkent. Uh-huh. By my will, not by his decision. Uh, that was one of the biggest things or challenges. Everybody was yelling, clapping from Africa. We had <laughs> 10 students from Africa, from Pakistan, from India, wow. from uh, Central America. Everybody was shouting, yes, yes, yes. And some of them, Allahu Akbar. Oh, oh, so so and at that time. So now next day, the dean calls me back. Mm-hmm. He calls me to his office. I went to his, I, I, I knew, uh, I like the challenge. I went to his office. He said, Muhammad. He called Muhammad, not Muhammad. Muhammad, why did you this, do this to me? I said, I, did I do it to you or you did it yourself? He says, here is the list. Please, please, please select Moscow, Moskovsky Energetitsky Institute, the Institute of Energy in Moscow. That's the best institute in the Soviet Union. I said, no, I will keep that to your sons. I'm going to Rashkan. Oh, I'm going to my land. <laughs> I'm going to my place. And I would, you will, sometime, you would hear about me and what I can do in Tashkan. Mashallah, mashallah. So with that, I think we're at 90 minutes. We're going to wrap it up. Uh, the, I guess this is just going to be part one because... Uh, oh, yeah, we're uh, just yeah, at the beginning. We're just at the beginning. So, uh, inshallah, the next episode is going to be even more exciting where we open up with Tashkat Bukhara, Uzbekistan. Um, uh, and inshallah, we just we can't wait to have him back. And inshallah, we'll release these uh, uh, frequently, like one after another. Uh, and uh, inshallah, you guys can continue on with the story. Uh, with that, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dr. Zalani, you just you can just like say alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Thank you very much. I'm sorry, uh, these two steps, or one and a half step, one and a half took, steps. took so, uh, yeah. so long. No, no, but we will continue, yeah. inshallah. The, the detail no. was great, and no, I think this, this is yeah. such an, a great spot to, to stop and come yeah. back. Well, inshallah, this, inshallah. This, inshallah. This whole thing called the making of a da'wah career. Inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. 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 It will be part of a series, we'll definitely. We're going to do inshallah. many series, inshallah. We'll have more people who will follow the steps and will carry the banner after we are gone from here and after I mean, we hand I mean, it I mean, to I mean, the younger I mean. brothers. With that, inshallah. assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.